renewal removes 10 years of yellow stains. That's like all the way back to 2010. What's that? It's a shake weight. It's a weight you shake. Remove 10 years of yellow stains with new Colgate Optic White Renewal. If Barb collects all the strings, our music will be destroyed forever. Trolls World Tour is out on digital and Blu-ray today, and I got to talk with star Rachel Bloom, but... Happening now. A stabbing this morning leaves two people hospitalized and a bloody crime scene left behind. I'm Devin Clark. Coming up, we'll tell you what neighbors heard and saw and have the latest on the suspect and the victims. We're learning new details about the Paycheck Protection Program. I'm Nadi Romero at the White House. I'll explain how a decision by Republican lawmakers could make a big impact on the economy and the president's chances for re-election. The Texas Teachers Association has new concerns about kids heading back to school. What extra measures they're asking for to prevent another spike in COVID-19 cases. Because of the pandemic, there are more people in need of food. Meals on Wheels is asking for your help as they see a decrease in volunteers. These are anxious times and alcohol sales are up. Coming up, how much is too much and why you shouldn't overindulge. And one last chance for a few showers before we crank up the heat even more. I'll tell you all about it in a few minutes. The News at 5 starts right now. First at five, do you recognize this man? He is wanted by San Antonio police in connection with a cutting on the city's east side this morning. 69-year-old Carlos Robinson accused of leaving a bloody scene behind at a home on Ferris Avenue after police say he cut his wife and his stepson then took off. Right now, Robinson remains on the run. Our Devin Clark has the latest from police and from his neighbors. I like just woke up and then my sister was like, there's a crime scene outside. Police got called to Ferris Avenue at Ava Joe just before 930 this morning for a cutting in progress. And I was like watching through the window and I seen cops and everything. And then I saw the blood on the chair. The victims, a mother and her teenage son. Police say the suspect is 69 year old Carlos Robinson and is the woman's husband and boy's stepfather. The juvenile male heard a verbal altercation escalate to which he heard some cries for help. He comes out, he identifies the suspect with a sharp cutting instrument. Police say the boy tried to talk the suspect into dropping the weapon, but instead say the suspect cut the boy in his upper body. The mother was cut numerous times. It's pretty scary. And people who live on this block couldn't provide many details about the family that lives here, they say because they just moved in about six months to a year ago. Like that house, like people always come and go. We do know the boy was taken to University Hospital and is expected to survive. The woman taken to Bamsey in serious but stable condition. On the east side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Here's another look at the suspect, Carlos Robinson, standing five foot six, 150 pounds. Police say he's wanted on three felony warrants and possibly armed and dangerous. If you see him or you know where he is, call 911. After weeks of waiting, the Texas Education Agency releasing guidance for reopening schools across the state. The TEA says parents will have the option to choose on campus learning each day or remote learning and remote learning will remain an option as the year progresses. Now, if parents choose remote learning. It does require a commitment to a full grading period, whether it be six or nine weeks. Students, staff and visitors will be screened before going on campus and masks will be required in school buildings with certain exceptions. Schools will be given the option to implement additional safety requirements and all guidelines like the mask guidelines are subject to change to be in line with the state. The TEA says it will provide resources to schools to ensure a strong start, including reimbursement for extra COVID-19 related expenses during the 2019-2020 school year. Personal protective equipment supplies, free online learning tools to deliver remote instructions, and teach or teacher training to bridge the digital divide for students that are learning at home. And with districts preparing to reopen in just more than a month, the Texas State Education, excuse me, the Texas State Teachers Association wants state officials to slow things down. In order to prevent another spike, the TSTA says that schools must reopen with caution, including additional safety measures like regularly testing students and staff, requiring face coverings for them, and enforcing social distancing in classrooms. In a statement, a Association President Noel Condelaria says in part, quote, millions of lives are at stake, beginning with our children, our educators, their families and communities, end quote. 
He says that we can't let what happened to the state's reopening happen in our schools. You can read the full article right now on KSAT.com. If you were planning to take a trip to Dallas for the State Fair of Texas this September, think again. For the first time since World War II, the State Fair has been canceled. Organizers citing the unpredictability of the pandemic as a reason to call it off. They say it was an extremely tough decision, but there is no feasible way to put out proper precautions while maintaining the fair environment that we all know and love. And from going back to school to visiting a friend, there's a lot of wonder about how risky different activities are when it comes to catching COVID-19. Right now on KSAT.com, we have a list of activities rated by risk factor. It's from the Texas Medical Association. Things considered low risk, pumping gas, and going camping. On the high end, going to a bar or eating at a buffet. You can read the full list and rate your own risks right now at KSAT.com. New data released by the federal government shows exactly who received loans from the Paycheck Protection Program, which was designed to help businesses stay afloat during the pandemic. For many of them, those loans are not even enough. As the White House and Republican lawmakers determine how to provide another financial boost, the president is looking for an economic turnaround going into the election. Nadia Romero is at the White House to break it all down for us. Nadia. Well, Ursula, this is a really important time for lawmakers on both sides of the aisle who are very passionate about what we do next to help the economy rebound. Are you concerned about the nation's rising debt or are you more concerned with putting money in Americans' pockets so they can pay their bills like their rent and put food on the table? Whatever happens next, and really it may come down to Senate Republicans, this will have a big impact on the economy and the president's reelection campaign. Following mounting pressure from lawmakers. We need to know if the program worked as intended by Congress. The federal government released key data over just who received money from the $660 billion Paycheck Protection Program. Some recipients of loans are raising eyebrows in Washington, including political organizations, lobbying groups, and Kanye West's fashion brand. The program was set up to help small businesses, including salons, gyms, and restaurants. But the data only shows payments of more than $150,000. And as the epidemic is forcing many businesses to limit service or remain closed, those loans are not enough. If there's not going to be more federal bailout for small restaurants and small businesses like this. I think they're going to suffer. President Trump also signaling a desire for more action as his re-election prospects are hinging on economic recovery. We built the greatest economy in the history of the world. And we are now doing it again. The administration now assessing their options. The president has been very clear that he's supportive of another stimulus uh, check. And yet at the same time, we want to make sure that we're addressing things uh, in, a, in a real systemic way. However, Republicans in Congress are divided as leadership weighs concerns over mounting debt against the need for more stimulus. Just how much more support does the economy in our country need to receive? to justify us borrowing even more money on top of it. So tomorrow, the president gets to focus on the economy. Back in 2016, during the election, he said he would get rid of NAFTA. Well, he did get rid of that trade deal and a compromise with House Democrats and worked on the USMCA. Now he gets to talk about that new tra trade deal between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada as Mexico's president comes here to the White House to discuss the new deal. Live from the White House, I'm Nadia Romero. Back to you in the studio. Thank you so much, Nadia. Well, a lot of sunshine out there this afternoon. Just to the north of our viewing area, we actually have a little extra cloud cover and even a few showers. But around here, it's nothing but the heat. Del Rio, Warren's Backyard, 102. Flores fell at 100. Shirts, 101. 95 now in Bernie. Utopia at 93. And Seguin checking in at 98. Those are our weather watcher readings. We'll take a look at the official reports in a few minutes. Otherwise, this evening, it's going to be sticky and humid. 93 still at 8 p.m., then down into the 80s by 10 p.m. And I think tomorrow morning will start the day at 80 degrees. This is our last little gasp for some rain. There's some activity north of town. We'll take a close look at this. Talk about the odds of anything making it uh, closer to town here. Talk about that coming up. The aquifer situation, how close we are to stage one restrictions coming up.
Thank you, Adam. New at five meals on wheels of San Antonio asking for help today, hoping that more people will volunteer to deliver meals to the more than 4,500 homebound people in need across the city. Before the pandemic, the organization was seeing about 160 volunteers each day. For the month of June, their numbers dropped significantly. And this past week, they were averaging much less, so only about 29 volunteers a day. It's important for them to know that the city cares about them. People are thinking about them because they're the ones who are homebound and isolated and often they're forgotten because they're unseen. You can help Meals on Wheels by calling the number on your screen 210-735-5115. We also have a link on our website at ksat.com. And a reminder, the San Antonio Food Bank is also in need of volunteers, so our KSAT community partners have created a call to action to get them the help they need. During the pandemic, the food bank has gone from serving about 60,000 people a week to serving 120,000 people a week. In order to meet the need, they rely on about 400 volunteers each week. Without those volunteers, the food bank fears may have to cancel some of these food giveaway events. If you'd like to help, we have a link to register right now on our website. Just go to ksatcommunity.com. On demand, in-depth perspective. It's the goal of our new weekly digital program, KSAT Explains. Last week, the KSAT Explains team examined some of the ways this pandemic has had an uneven impact on our city. This week, we're continuing that discussion. Here's a preview. There's a lot of people who are working, you know, two or three jobs at minimum wage, and they're just barely getting by. Why don't we actually have jobs that are paying living wages that are allowing for food security? We have to have the conversation around a living wage. What does it take to make it in our city? You know, a lot of people talk about urban areas like ours, particularly San Antonio, as being a tale of two cities. There are uh, many people in our community that work, that their livelihoods are by and large intact. But there is a whole other side of this world, a whole other side of our city, where people are not uh, as fortunate. KSAT explains the uneven impact of COVID-19 will be available to stream on Thursday. It will be available on the KSAT TV app on your Roku, Fire Stick or most other smart television devices. It'll also be available on KSAT.com. Playing youth sports during a pandemic. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has some new advice on how to do that safely. Out on the field, back on the court. For millions of children, playing organized sports this season will be like no other. And the CDC has updated guidelines for youth sports safety in the age of COVID-19. Most of the advice, practices already being encouraged by everyone. Things like wash your hands, stay home when sick, practice social distancing. But it's also recommended that there be no handshakes, high fives or fist pumps, no sharing of equipment, towels or clothing, and no spitting. Parents and coaches are also encouraged to reduce contact between players, limit travel, and establish small groups within teams to interact in. And they should decide if and when players should wear face masks. Staff and spectators are also advised to wear face coverings. The CDC says coaches should educate players and parents about the new safety measures, ensure that conditions are sanitary, and remain diligent about social distancing. The CDC's message to coaches, be a role model. Wear your face mask. Living through a pandemic can bring on a lot of stress. For some, that might mean queuing up the booze. Up next, how much is too much and how to be sure you aren't going overboard. And these are anxious times to be sure. You may be dealing with job loss, a stressful household, or just plain boredom. That can lead to even occasional drinkers to overdo it. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz looks at why it's important to keep alcohol intake in balance. Booze is seeing a bump. Sales of alcohol for home consumption were up 22% this spring. Wine and beer delivery and carry out cocktails are now permitted at a lot of places. That plus stress and boredom can lead even light to moderate drinkers to overindulge. The downside can be more than a headache. 
heavy drinking obviously isn't healthy and it can damage your liver and heart and cause other health problems. But over time, even moderate drinking can be harmful. It can raise the risk of some cancers and it also harms the healthy bacteria that live in your gut, which help you protect against illnesses. Even small amounts of alcohol can interact with some medications, so it's important to check with your doctor or pharmacist. So how much is too much? For most people, CR says a glass of wine or beer with dinner or a Zoom call with friends is generally fine. But they say women should stick to no more than one drink a day, two for men. And how much is a drink? Probably less than you think. 12 ounces for beer, five ounces for wine, and one and a half ounces for a shot of spirits. Wine glasses come in a variety of shapes and sizes, so it's best not to eyeball it. And maybe skip that extra glass before bed. Alcohol may help you not off at first, but it interferes with the brain changes that take place in the later stages of sleep. So you may not sleep as well. So cheers to water. Staying hydrated can help prevent headaches, help your immune system work better, and can even boost your mood. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. And water very handy on days like today. I was about to say that looked quite refreshing, Marilyn. <laughs> All right, li live look downtown. You see the wind blowing out there as we look at the Tower Life building. Yeah, it's that humid breeze <laughs> coming off the Gulf of Mexico, and we're feeling the humidity and the heat, and our heat high is only going to get stronger, and we're going to feel the heat grow more intense. So if you thought today was hot, just get yourself mentally and physically prepared for the days ahead. We'll talk about the heat and how hot it's going to get coming up, but I want to also talk about the aquifer and how close we are to stage one water restrictions. Take a look at this graph. This is the aquifer since June 1st, and that line across it at 660, yeah, that's the critical mark because once the 10 day rolling average drops below that, that's when stage one restrictions are enacted. Now our current level is below 660. The 10 day average is at 660.5. We think stage one restrictions are right around the corner for us though. And you look at our percent of normal precipitation over the past 30 days and Austin is actually pretty close to their 30 day average, but the rest of us uh, quite a bit below average, especially Del Rio, only 12% of their 30 day average precipitation here in San Antonio, 44%. Now exactly average would be 100% there. So clearly a lot of us running below average and we still have an expanding drought situation as well. So a little bit of hope out there right now for some folks, especially Edwards Plateau, Northern Hill Country. This activity is having a hard time making it southward, but it is along the I-10 corridor, especially west of Sonora. Fredericksburg, parts of Gillespie County, it's trying to make it to you. Our one hope with this is that the outflow boundaries that are getting kicked out of these showers and storms will move southward and trigger new showers and new downpours. We can hang on to hope, but I wouldn't hold your breath for that happening. I give it about a 10 to 20% chance at best there, but there is some rain across other parts of Texas again today. We talked about this yesterday, closer to Dallas, Tyler and East Texas. They've had some good rainfall because of this little divot in the upper level flow. That's an upper level disturbance and they're closer to it. They've got the energy and ample moisture to get that activity going, even stretching into Louisiana and the Gulf coastline there. Good rainfall. We're just a little too far removed and the big blue H the upper level high over New Mexico and that's going to strengthen in the days ahead. So it's really going to become the dominating force in our weather. And that means really no chance of rain. We're giving it a 10% chance tomorrow. That may be even a stretch. And then we're looking at just sunny days from there on out. And speaking of a strengthening heat high, that means temperatures are on the rise. So right now we're at 98 degrees. Feels like 104 when you factor in the humidity. Catula 103, Carrizo Springs, 104, and we're above 100 in Del Rio, New Braunfels at the century mark. And when you factor in the humidity though, it feels like we're above 100, 100, pretty much everywhere except the hill country, feels like we're in the 90s there. So let's talk about tomorrow. We'll start the day, upper 70s to right near 80 for most of us. Then by the afternoon, Gonzales 97, Catula Laredo, about 103, and in the low to mid 90s in the hill country, we're thinking 99 here in San Antonio for the afternoon high. So it's going to look and feel a lot like what we had out there today. Some morning clouds, a lot of afternoon sunshine. And then here we go. We crank up the heat back above the century mark Ooh. by Friday and into the weekend and early next Ooh. week. 
Yeah, that heat, uh, high, heat high really wow. takes over. We're looking at about 104, 105 for highs then. You kicked it up a notch for Monday, didn't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ouch. All right, so the Spurs are heading to Orlando. Yes. How concerned are they about COVID and their head coach? Well, very concerned when you consider the fact he is in that category most susceptible to the coronavirus. When we come back, what are the priorities of protecting Pop? We'll check in with Rudy Gay about that. And more NBA players opt out of continuing the season. I'll tell you why coming up. Spurs players enjoying a day off before they return to work tomorrow before departing for Orlando in the NBA bubble at the Wide World of Sports Complex at Disney World in Florida on Thursday. Rudy Gay, who's now 33 years old, will turn 34 next month as one of the older players participating in the NBA restart in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Florida cases continue to rise. There's 7,361 new cases in the state just today, but Rudy's age is not even close to that of Spurs head coach Greg Popovich, who is now 71 and in the category the most susceptible to catching the virus. How concerned is Rudy in protecting Bob and perhaps even older staff members when the season resumes on July 31st. Well, I mean, we have special guidelines and special things that we, uh, you know, we have to abide by. So, um, you know, I think uh, going into this, uh, into this bubble, everybody has to take the proper precautions and, and do their own part um, going into it because uh, because of situations like that, because of pop, because of coming us some of the older guys on our staff and, you know, not just our team, but, you know, other teams. So, um, you know, it's definitely serious. It's a serious issue, but, you know, we, we have, uh, we vowed to do the right thing, so we have to do it. All right, the Brooklyn Nets will not have guard Spencer Dinwiddie when they resume their season in the NBA bubble in Florida. That's because he is tested positive for the coronavirus again. It was Dinwiddie himself that tweeted out the news today. Another positive test yesterday. And considering the symptoms, team doctors and I have decided that it would be in the best interest for the for me and the team that I do not play in Orlando. I'll be supporting the guys every step of the way. Dinwiddie's teammate, DeAndre Jordan, also tested positive for COVID-19, has already opted out on Orlando on the NBA restart. The Washington Wizards Bradley Beal is also out on the NBA restart, not because of the coronavirus, but because of a right rotator cuff injury. The Wizards tell us he has been experiencing shoulder discomfort since early in the season and only got worse during the NBA hiatus. And that started in March due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The NFL Players Association has escalated its demand that no preseason games be played in 2020 before they kick off the regular season. This comes after the NFL decided to get rid of two preseason games for every team, games one and games four, and in addition would not play the Hall of Fame game in Canton, Ohio, between the Dallas Cowboys and the Pittsburgh Steelers. But in a blog, J.C. Treader wrote that the NFLPA agreed to a 48-day training camp with no preseason games after a rash of Achilles tendon and hamstring injuries followed the 2011 World lockout so they still have something to work out there and also coming up at six now the texas state fair has been canceled what happens to the texas ou game got that for you coming up at six yeah the big game there thank you Greg. huge yeah we'll be right back now tomorrow's gonna be a lot like today's morning clouds afternoon sun making it up to near 100 in the afternoon then it only gets hotter we're looking at about 104 105 as we get into the tail end of the weekend and early next week. So be prepared. Nope. <laughs> Not happy with it. Never prepared. Not happy with it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching the News at 5 with us.